Welcome to Live Doff, your online Doff Yomi Shear. Shalom Aleichem, welcome back. Today's Daf Yomi is Maseches Yevomis Daf Mem. We are holding at the last line of Lama Tessa Madbez, right in the middle of that line. A Marisha. We left off with the Machlekes, between Abba Shol, who says that when we speak about Yevoma Yove Yoleo, it has to be done L'Shem Shemai. Otherwise, it's almost considered doing an Avera, engaging with his sister-in-law. So here, intent, Kavana, pure motivation, is what's needed. Rabbanon say, sure, <laughs> a good Kavana is always good, but it's not Mi'akim, it doesn't disqualify the Yibam. And therefore, even Bezman where we don't have that ability uh, to have uh, pure motivation, says the Gemara, we can do Yibam. Now we had a Bryce. Yivama Yavi Yolea, and the Bryce said Mitzvah. We had two, two interpretations. Either it can be explained according uh, to Abba Shol, that has to be L'Shem Mitzvah, Yivama Yavi Yolea, Le Mitzvah. That's a precondition. Or it can be following Rabbanon. The Bryce is simply saying that uh, the preferred option between Yivam and Chalitza, the preferred option is Yivam. Yivam Yavela Mitzvah. That's the preferred Mitzvah. But intent? That's not what we're talking about. So even without proper Kavana, it is still a proper Yivam. So we have two explanations on this price. Either it's following uh, the Rabbanon or Abba Shol. Says the Gemara, how can you say that the Brisa is in line with Abba Shol and in effect telling us that it has to be limits? Right? There are two ways of doing this thing. L'shem uh, Shemayim or for other, other purposes. It has to be done L'shem Shemayim. How can that be the Pshat and the Brisa? Because Take a look at the first pro- part of the b'risa, which seems to be uh, mirroring. Uh, it's it's like almost a, a parallel track. It's a similar concept to the second part of the b'risa. And in the beginning of the b'risa, where we use similar language, uh, the, the meaning of mitzvah over there can only work like the, the Rabbanan's interpretation of mitzvah. Let's see. Says the more emeration. Let's take a look back at the beginning of the Bryce, which focuses on the Pasuk of Matzois to Yochah B'makam Kaddish. So we speak about the Kehanim eating the leftovers of the Mincha after he took the Kmitzah, he, like he scooped out, put on the Mizbech, leftovers go to the Kehanim. And we learn that it has to be Mitzvah. Soon we'll explain the Bryce, right? So there's a special Mitzvah to eat it. Shabbat Chilah HaYisa Olav Bechlal Heter. Initially, before, you were Magdish, this material, you could have eaten it. It was non hegdish Nestra, once you made it hegdish it became Asr La'achila. But then after you did the Akhtaras HaKmitza, the Chazr Bahutra, the leftovers become Mutter. Yachal Tachsar Lehetera Harishan, perhaps it reverts back to its original status and it's to- totally Mutter. Tamalayma, that's why the Pasuk says, Matzah Te'achil, Pimakim Kaddish, which tells you Mitzvah. End quote. What did, what did the Bryson mean? Now, Bishleim el So this would work according to Rava's explanation of the Bryson. That Yivama Yavi Yalea Mitzvah means you have two separate uh, routes you can take. You can do the Yivam or the Chalitza. Yivama Yavi Yalea Mitzvah. It's a Mitzvah to do the Yivam over the Chalitza. So according to that explanation, we can explain this part of the Bryson as well. Along the same lines, Bishlam Lu Rava the Amar Hamani Rab Bonani, Bryce says following Rab Bonan, Hacha Hachik Amar. Here as well, the Bryce means, Matzah is Te'achel B'Makam Kaddish, Mitzvah. You should know that this is actually a Mitzvah. Shabbatchila Ha'isa Allah B'Chal Heter. Initially, the material used in the Mincha was Mutter B'Achila. Up to you. Ratzah Eichla, Ratzah Eino Eichla. It's up to you. You can eat it. You doesn't have to eat it. Nesra, once it became a mincha, chaz, and then you makter the kaimitz, chazr v'hotra, 
it comes back and becomes mutter again, perhaps just as mutter as before. Yochel tachzor, la'atayr arishon, perhaps it goes back to its original status, which means, ro'atza eichla, ro'atza eina eichla, it's up to him, eat it, don't eat it, and there's no uh, mitzvah to eat it. One second, let's stop right here. Ro'atza eina eichla, what do you mean? He doesn't have to eat it. It's certainly a mitzvah, it's part of the hakrovas hakorb, that the kahanam should have the remnants, that completes the kapora. We learn from here. The Gehanim consuming the rest of the carbon, in this case the remnants of the Kmitza, generates Kapara for its owner. Of course they have to eat it. Ella, what then does the Bryson mean? Perhaps any kind can eat it. If the kind who actually did the Avoida wants to, he can eat it. Rotza koyin acher eichla, or perhaps if another koyin chooses to have it, he can have it. There's no preference. Is that so? Talmud leimar, matzos to yochel b'makom kodesh, and we learn from here mitzvah. The uh, fellow, the koyin who is actually engaged in the avoda, should be the one doing it. So when we say matzos to yochel mitzvah, it means this uh, koyin eating it is the preferred mitzvah, as opposed to another koyin. So there's one way of doing it. There's a, a different type of thing you can do. No, do do this one. Just like by the Yibam versus Chalitza. Prefer the Yibam over the Chalitza. So according to uh, the Rabbanon, the whole Brisa is in sync. Prefer this over something else. El the Rav Yitzchak Bar Avdimi. According to the other approach, the Amar Abashol, he, who explained that the Brisa is following Abashol. Within the mass of Yibam, you can sort of do two ways, with proper intentions or without proper intentions. And the Bryce is telling you, do it with the proper kavana. If that's the case, let's go back to the first part of the Bryce, speaking about Achilles HaMincha. And we employ the word mitzvah. In this case, you don't have a choice between yes kavana and no kavana. Here there's no uh, precondition of kavana. By yibum you can say, you know, if it's not for the Shem Shemayim, it's as though you're engaging with an erva. After all, that's where she is. So the kavana sort of undoes, removes the iser. But by a mincha, even without kavana, the Shem Mitzvah, it's still, a, it's still a mitzvah. The chitema, perhaps you'll say, that the two variations of the achila over here would be as follows. Ratzel letay avayn ayichla. If he wants, he can eat it, you know, for satiation. Or you can actually overeat. Stuff the mincha. It's, it's not a proper achila. No, you have to do it properly. That's the word mitzvah. So it's the same ma'asa achila. Here it's done properly, imp- improperly. And you meant to do it appropriately. Says the Gemara, achila gasa mishma achila. Is there any room to even think that achila gasa would be considered an achila? If one overeats on Yom Kippur, he's potter. We're speaking that he filled himself before Yom Kippur, and then come Yom Kippur, he added more. That's not an achila. The Pasuk says, if one does not engage in painting himself, he gets cursed. So the point of Yom Kippur is to paint oneself. And here Rashi says, actually, when he overeats, this is a mass of Inu. He's mazik. He's harming himself. So this type of eating is not considered achila. And we certainly know that a mincha must be eaten. We have uh, we have other psukim. It says v'achlu iron abano. It's pashit. Even without this new pasuk of matzahs to achlu b'makom kadosh. So what then is the uh, pasuk trying to teach us? Ella, perhaps like this. You can have the leftover of the mincha in two forms. Rotza matzah echla, rotza chametz echla. Perhaps the havamina would be. You can have it as matzah, you can turn it into chametz. The Pasuk says, no, matzah is, is a mitzvah. How can you say that? You should not uh, turn the mincha into chametz. And even the portion of the kehanim must be kept free of chametz. Even the chalkam of kehanim cannot be turned into chametz. That's, that's not an option. 
So what then is the choice that you're faced with that the Pasuk has to emphasize mitzvah? Ela rotza matza eichla, rotza cholot eichla. Oh. Perhaps I would think that you can have it as matzah, baked in an oven. You can have it as cholot, scolded with hot water. And that's why the Pasuk has to say matzah is, as opposed to cholot. Asks the Gemara, cholot dami. What type of scolding are we speaking about? Im matzahi, if it was not allowed to leaven, to turn into matzah, hamatzahi, it's considered matzah. Why would you discount it? Vilay matzahi, if it's no longer matzah, it stayed around long enough to turn into chametz, matzah is amarach mona. The Pasuk says elsewhere that the milcha has to remain, has to be eaten as matzah. You don't need a new Pasuk. Says the Gemara, lo'olam, Perhaps it is considered a technically matzah. Oh, typically it's called matzah, but the Pasuk is going to repeat matzah is to achal again to tell you that it has to be pure matzah and it's a ideal form, unaffected by, um, by, by, by scolding and all that. It has to be properly baked. So perhaps that's the point of the Pasuk here. There are two forms, two ways of having this. You could have it as plain dough baked as matzah or dough which is also scolded or perhaps only scolded and Pasuk is telling you, you know, eat it in its pure form the way it's meant to be as matzah. Asks the Gemara. Now, by the way, you just said to me that even something which is chalut is considered matzah. It seems in the Gemara that we're speaking about first having it scolded and then baked it in an oven. It's considered matzah, but for mincha you need pure matzah, unaffected by this hot water. When you say that technically, universally, even something which is scolded before baking is considered matzah, to what effect? What, what's the uh, application? Which halacha would it uh, apply to? Loimar to tell you, on Pesach. You can use this type of matzah. Although uh, the first step was scolding, even the other after you tano, but since he placed it in an oven afterwards, lechem oini kurinim base consider lechem oini v'atzam v'adam yoytze by the chavasu of Pesach, and it can be used on Pesach. So bottom line is we have a brayse which speaks about how to eat a mincha, the leftovers of the mincha, and it says matzah is to achal b'makom kadosh. It's an extra pasuk to tell you mitzvah. What does that mean? You have two interpretations. Either the Pasuk is telling you that this kind should be eating it, the one that was engaged in the Avoida, that's the better way of doing it. Or we have another approach which is based on the Abashol approach. We're speaking about one type of Achila, but there are two methods, two ways, two forms of consuming. It's the same kind, the same Achila, and the Pasuk is telling you eat it in a matzah form as opposed to one which is also scolded with hot water. Says the Mishnah, Achoy, let's leave him to. If Shimon does chalitza to Ruvain Zivama, Harayhu ke echad v'na achla nachla, he's now considered like his other brothers with respect to dividing the properties of Ruvain. As opposed to when he's binyavim, he gets it all. No, here he, he's treated equally like the other brothers. V'miyesham av, if there is a father alive there. Nuchasim Shalab, he gets it all before his sons. He is Yerush's son before the brothers. Hakoyness is Yivim Toy, if he does Yibum, Zachab and Nuchasim Shalab, Hachiv, he takes over all the properties of his departed brother. Rabbi Da'imar, he disagrees. Benkach or Benkach, whether it's Chalitza or Yibum, Im Yesham Av, Nuchasim Shalab, if there's a father around, father gets it all. So Mishnah spoke about a Chalitz getting a portion of his brother's properties. Pshita, of course, why not? Perhaps I would think. After all, Chalitza is the alternative to Yibam. And just like by Yibam, he gets it all. Here as well, Vinishkal Kulu Nixi, let him acquire all his possessions. Kamashmon, the Chalitza is no. Ami Yabam does, but not a Chalitza. If that's the point, that he doesn't get it all, only a portion, then the Mishnah, instead of saying Harihu ke'echad min ha'achem, we consider him like the other brothers, which sounds like we're trying to bump him up. Yeah, he is considered like the brothers. He has some sort of rights of Yerusha. Instead of that, it should have said, he's only like the other brothers. 
He's not better than them. He's considered only like them. Enoi elo. As opposed to a miyabim who gets it all, he only gets a portion. If that's the point of the Mishnah, to downgrade him from 100% to only a portion. Elo. Rather, the wording of the Mishnah indicates that we're trying to bump him up. You would think perhaps he doesn't get anything. No, he gets something. Why wouldn't he get? Perhaps. By him doing chalitza, he is disqualifying her from yibam. He's making her, making her lose that option from even the other brother. That's it. It's over. Lickner say, perhaps we'll apply a penalty and have him lose all his rights to his brothers in the chasm, Kamash Mala. No. He doesn't lose his portion. If there's a father around, father gets in the chasm of Ruben. Father precedes his offspring. Which means that if Reuben passes away without children, father, Yaakov, gets it before Shimon and and Yudah. If he does Yivam, he gets it all. My time, Yokum al Shemachav Amarachmana, Bari Kam. He proceeded, he did Yivam, he gets his brother's properties. Rabbi Daimer, if father is around, even in a case of Yivam, father gets it all. Amar Ula, Halach Rabbi Yudah, that's how he paskin. Vechena or Bisak Nafcha, Halacha Rabbi Yudah. Vamar Ula, Bi Tema, some say Rabbi Sak Nafcha. My time, Mad Rabbi Yudah, where is he coming from? And we learn that this is the Yavam, who gets Nechassim, who takes over his departed brother's estate. The Pasuk compares them to Bukhar. And we learn as follows. Ki Bukhar, ma Bukhar, ein loy, b'chay Just as a Bukhar, when it comes to his double portion from his father's Nechassim, it's not during father's lifetime. Av hainami, the Yavam as well, who is Zoycha, in his brother's Nechassim, ein loy, b'chay this doesn't happen during father's lifetime. Father is the head of the family. He takes over Ruven's Nechassim. If so, let's compare it even further to Bukhar. Perhaps, just as a Bukhar gets his double portion after father's death. Afhai, here as well by a Yavam. So father takes the Nechassim, according to Behuda. But then, father passes away. Perhaps the Yavam should now, at least now, he should get his own portion and his brother's portion in his father's estate. Responds to the Gemara, Midi Yokum al Shem Aviv Ksib. Does the Pasuk say, Well, he's going to take over his father's possessions? Yokum al Shem Aviv Ksib. He takes over his brother's possession. Veloi al Shem Aviv, and not his father. So, sure, if a father's not around, he takes over his brother's Nechassan, but his father takes. That's it. So, even when father passes away, all sons are treated equally. Amo, well, let's say like this. When there's no father around who would theoretically take Ruvain's possessions, in that case, since Shimon the Yavim can take over Ruvain's possessions, Yivam is now applicable. Because you can be Mekayim, you can fulfill and, and proceed with the process the way it's meant to be. But if there's a father around, in which case, Shimon is prevented from taking Ruvain's Nechassim, in which case you're not really fulfilling the mitzvah Yibam properly. Why does Kaya mitzvah Yibam? Perhaps in that case, don't do Yibam. Answers the Gemara. It's not interconnected. Mi de Yibam banachlo taler achmano? Is Yibam dependent on taking inheritance and possessions and, and, and estates? Yibum mi yabmi. Do Yibam. Ve'ika nachlo. Shkuli. If there is nachlo available, go ahead and take it. Gesundheit. Ve'lai, but otherwise. Let's say there's no Nachla, or there's a father who's uh, going to take first. Lo Yishach, in that case, he won't have it. It's a side fridge benefit. It's not integral to the mitzvah sifim. Yosef Rav Chanina Kara, Rav Chanina, the uh, psukim expert, was sitting Kamei Rav Yanni. Yosef Amar, and he related as follows. Halacha, Rabbi Yehuda. I have a Mishnah, or Brisa, that the Halacha follows Rabbi Yehuda. Amar Lei, sorry, he was saying his own shita, Halacha, Rabbi Yehuda. Amr lay, Sir Vianney responded, Puk kari karyuch lebara. Go read your, uh, your uh, a statement outside. Meaning, that's not the halach. Ain halach ka Yehuda. We don't follow Rabbi Yehuda. Tani tana kamei Rav Nachman. There was a uh, tana who presented a brisa to Rav Nachman. Ain halach ka Yehuda. In fact, we don't follow Rabbi Yehuda's shita. Amr lay, Sir Rav Nachman responded, What's the chiddush? Ela keman. Who do we follow? Karabbanon? We follow the Rabbanon that the Yavim always takes over the estate of the departed brother. Pshita, of course, it's obvious. 
when we have a machlokes between a yachid and individual varabim, of course, Allah Kerab, why would you think otherwise? Oh, Malay Asmai. So the Tana tells of Nachman, okay, uh, you got me there. Should I just delete this brisa? Oh, Malay. He said, no, Loi, don't do that. At Halach Asnayach. The truth is that you probably had learned that the Halacha follows Rabbi Yehuda. That's probably your original version. Umuksha Huda Akshalach. And you had some difficulty accepting that because why would we abandon the Rabban who are a Rabbin? The Afchas. And that's why you reversed your, your Mishnah, your Brahisa. You changed it from Halacha Rabbi Yehuda to Ein Halacha Rabbi Yehuda. Ulamai Da Afchas, Shaper Afchas. And indeed, your reversal um, indeed presents it properly. That's the correct approach. Ein Halacha Rabbi Yehuda. But really, in its original form, it was Halacha Rabbi Yehuda. And the one who held that way was uh, voicing his, his, his shita. It's not considered uh, an unnecessary bribe, so unnecessary mission, because the one that held Allah Rabbi Yehuda was uh, actually supporting Rabbi Yehuda as opposed to the Rabbana. That was a real chiddush. And it was truly an uh, interesting uh, a lesson and a phenomenon that we follow Rabbi Yehuda as opposed to the Rabbana. But the fact is, we don't follow that bribe, so we should switch it because we follow the Chacham. Says the Mishnah, Ha'choyles li'vimtay. Shimon does chalitza to Ruven's wife, Rachel. Mid the Rabbanon, we treat her as though she was divorced from him. Because chalitza and gerish are very similar. As though she was married to him. And what happens then? As we know, one may not involve himself with his wife's relatives. Who also b'kerevesseh, therefore mid the Rabbanon. We apply the same halachas to a chalutzo. He may not marry her relatives. And likewise, she may not marry his relatives. Who else be imo? Let's go down the list. He may not engage with her mother. Her mother's mother. Her father's mother. Her daughter. Her daughter's daughter. Her son's daughter. And finally, her sister. Of course, when the chalutzo is still alive, so it's like a wife. Who, uh, who uh, would make her sister usher to you while wife is alive, even after divorce? Va'achin mutarin. This only pertains to Shimon the Chalitz, but his other brothers, who did not actually engage in chalitza, they are free to marry her relatives. So that's as far as her relatives. And likewise, if he asur be'aviv, she may not marry his father or be'avi aviv, his father's father, or be'bnoi his son, or be'ben bnoi his son's son, or be'achiv his brother, or ben achiv. Son of his brother, his nephew. Concludes the Mishnah with a slightly cryptic statement. Mutar Adam, the Kravas Tsoras Chalutza. Although he cannot engage the relatives of his Chalutza, but let's say the Chalutza has a Tsara who is not involved in the Chalutza, her relative is okay. But the Chalutza, let's say in this case, is Rachel, who has, happens to have a sister. Not a Tsara, just a sister. And that sister happens to have a tzara, just as you can't marry the karav of the chalutza, you can't marry the tzara of the karav of the chalutza, and the Gemara will explain this halach. Says the Gemara Iboilu, the Bnei Yeshiva wanted to know as follows. Gozru shniyoiz pechalutza, oi loi. Some arayis, most basic arayis, are also menater. So wives, sister, daughter, mother, etc. What about the shniyoiz? which we discussed back in Afchav Beis. The extended relatives. Secondary relatives. That extra layer of relatives, further out, which are Asam and Rabbanon, on account of the closer ones. What about by Chalutza, which is really a Rabbanon to begin with? Do they extend the Isra to the Shniyas as well? Do we treat it like a regular Erva or not? Be'erva de'iraisa, goz rebuhu Rabbanon Shniyas by an ordinary erva, in other words, a real wife, Rabban extended the Issa to Shniyas as well. Be'chalutza like Gazer Rabban Shniyas, perhaps not by a chalutza, a Dilma, perhaps, like there's no difference. Because once she's considered like a wife, she's treated like a wife. The other side is, no, it's like a gzera l'gzera, double, a double safeguard. The whole Issa of Kar of Chalutza is only with Rabban, perhaps we limit it, or no. Once we... Um, tag her as a wife, we treat her as such without any differentiation. Tashma, 
here comes a string of many rights. Ultimately, the Gemara is going to say that yes, Shniyas are included. Okay, let's let's keep track here. Toshma. The mission spoke about the list of relatives. Who asr be imo? He might he may not approach her mother. Ube aimim mother's mother. Vilu, but aim aim imo like tani. Why does the mission leave out mother's mother's mother, great grandmother, which is a shnia? Why do we leave it out? Dil mahainu taima. Maybe the reason is the tani. The reason for not mentioning it, really, it's asr. Rather, Mishum the Kaboy the Mishnah Seifa. The Mishnah wanted to continue, and Seifa Achim would turn. The brothers of the Chaylitz are not involved in the Isra. They are Mutter. Okay. Vi'itana Aim Aim Ima. Had the Mishnah mentioned great grandmother, Hava Mina, perhaps I would think, when we say Ha'achim would turn, brothers are Mutter, it's only going on this one. Dafka Be'aim Aim Ima. Aval, but let's say Be'aim Ima. Mother's mother. Ubi Ima, just mother. Lai, that's too close. That would be us even to the brothers. In order to avoid that confusion, we just left her out. And this way we know that they are a mutter, even by Imma and Imma. Right? I would think perhaps the heter of the brothers only pertain to the uh, the uh, second level uh, relative, the, the, the Shnir, but not to the immediate relatives. So that's why we don't discuss Shnirs. And now we know brothers are mutter even to the close relatives. Okay, but we can get around that pretty easily. For listening, mission should say. Aim aim ima, great grandmother is asr, and then say well listening and ha'achin mutar makula, brothers are mutar all without differentiation. It's pretty clear. Kashi indeed we lead as a kashi. Toshma here comes another right. He asr ba'avin, she may not marry his father. So we have let's say the uh, the fellow who died his name was Ruvain, the brother who did chalitza the chalitz is Shimon. Their father, their joint father, is Yaakov. Okay, so the Mishnah says, she may not marry the father, Uba vi aviv, father's father, who is actually a Shani, it's a Shniya. Ketane miya, avi aviv, father's father, that's a Shani. My love, should we not assume? Mishum chayetz. The reason for Isser is on account of her relationship with Shimon. The havila kalas p'noi. We treat her as though she is Shimon's wife. That's the essence of the Isser of Chalutza. It's as though she was his wife. In which case, Shimon's father's father is also because she is Kalas Bnei, which means she's his son's daughter-in-law, which is really a Shniya. Here we go. Shniya is Asr. La, that's not the reason for her being Asr on Avi Aviv. Misha Misna. Keep in mind that the Isha, let's call her Rachel, the Chalutza, was actually once married to Ruvain, the Mace. Really married, really his wife. Which produces Arais all around. The Havi Lakalas Benoi. In which case, certainly, the grandfather here can't marry her. She's really his son's daughter-in-law, right? <laughs> she was actually married to Ruvain. So Ruvain and Shimon's grandfather, Avi Aviv, is also in her because, perhaps not because of her experience with Shimon, the Chalitza, simply because she was married to Ruvain. Avi Aviv's son, his name is Yaakov, is daughter-in-law. And that's a, a Shniya, but we understand that here it's uh, applicable because here she was really his wife. By a real wife, of course we apply Shniya. So this isn't the Raya to our Shaila. What do we apply Shniya for Chalutza? Toshma, here comes another Raya. Ube Ben Benoi. The Chalutza can't marry Shimon's Ben Benoi. Well, that again is a, is a Shniya. My love, Mishim Chalutz. The reason perhaps is because of her relationship with Shimon the Chalutz. The Havila Eishes Avi Aviv. So why can't this grandson marry her? Because she's considered the wife of his father's father. Here we go. This is another version of Shnia, which is applied to a Chalutza. Lo, that's not why. Same reason as before. Misha Misna. Let's remember that she was once really married to Ruvain. And 
in that case, she's an everyday rice, and we, of course, add Shniyais to the uh, to the list. Vehavila Eishes, Achi Avi Aviv. So what's her relationship to Chaylitz, to Shimon's Ben Benoi? Work your way up. She is the wife. The wife of Ruvain. So it's the wife of the brother of his father's father. And that is a Shnir. But not because of the Chalitza, because she was actually married to Ruvain. Okay? Says the what do you mean? But that's too far. Ha'amemar machshar. Back in the Bays, I remember clearly told us this is too much for a Shnir. This it's not included in Shnir. Answers the Gemara. I remember Mukila be Barber. Oh, I remember is going to reinterpret the Mishnah. Mukila be Barber de Saba. When we learn Ben Benoy in the Mishnah, no, 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 we're not speaking about the Chaylitz, Shimon's Ben Benoy. We're speaking about whose grandson? The grandfather's grandson. Let's go back a dirt. Let's go back up a generation to the father, to Aviv, right? To Yaakov. Who's his grandson? Not Shimon's son. Remember, there's another brother there. Let's call him Levi, right? He's Achiv of Shimon. The brother there. Third brother. That fellow's son. So that's Ben Benoi that we're talking about. Barbara de Saba. Oh, so now we understand why that fellow can, uh, cannot go ahead and marry Rachel, who was Ruvain's wife. Ruvain, the potted brother. Why? Very Pasha. She's his aunt. <laughs> right? We went up a generation. The Ben Benoi is Yaakov's Ben Benoi. Right? So it's Shimon's brother's son, Shimon's nephew. Of course that nephew can't marry Rachel, who was once Reuben's wife. Why? She's his uh, father's brother's wife. It's an everyday raisa. Nothing to do with Shniyas. Yochi, if that's the case, Hainu Achiv. Who ben Achiv? If Ben Benoi in the Mishnah is referring to Shimon's nephew, not his son, Shimon's nephew, we call him Ben Benoi because... That's in relation to the father Yaakov, Yaakov's grandson. Well, then that's Achiv and Ben Achiv discussed in the Mishnah. Right? We're saying Benoi means Yaakov's son, and Ben Benoi is Yaakov's grandson. Right? So Benoi is Levi, let's say, and Ben Benoi is the son of Levi. So then why does the Mishnah also say Achiv, the brother of Shimon? It's the same fellow. And Ben Achiv, his nephew. It's a repetition. Tana Achiv mina av. Uktani Achiv mina'im. The reason why the Mishnah mentions both. We're speaking about two different types of brothers. Benoi Ben Benoi is speaking about Yaakov Avinu. <laughs> Yaakov. Right? The grandfather Yaakov's son and grandson. So Yaakov's son happens to be Shimon's brother with whom he shares a father. So it's his bro- father and his... Uh, sorry, it's his brother and his nephew from his father's side. And when the Mishnah says, Achiv, Shimon's brother, and Ben Achiv, his nephew, was speaking that he only shares a mother with that brother. It's a different type of relative. That's why we mentioned it twice. Okay, two versions of the same type of idea. In any case, we have no riot at Awashayla. Perhaps we're speaking about a totally different context. Speaking about an Issa, which stems from Rachel being married, having been married to Ruvain, or as Amemah would say, we're speaking about an everyday rice. Toshma, here comes another raya, a raya which we can't refute. The Tani Rabchia, we have a Bryce from Rabchia, which gives us a full comprehensive list of the Arayas, of the Kroivas that are Asr on account of Chalitz. Arba Midivere Torah, the Arba Midivere Seifrim. There are four. That would be also in Torah. Meaning, let's say, this uh, Chalutza, right? Shimon was Chalutz Rachel, would have really been Shimon's wife. Then the following four would be also in Torah. And we have another four, which are Shniyais, and would only be also in the Rabbana. And they all apply to a Chalutza, we treat her like a wife. Okay, let's see. We have Av, 
Shimon's father. Ubnai, Shimon's son. Achiv, Shimon's brother. Uben Achiv, the Chayelitz's nephew. These are Medivir Torah. These are the first uh, tier, first circle of relatives. Let's go to the extended relatives, to the Shneis. Avi Aviv, the Chayelitz's father's father. Avi Imai, his mother's father. Two types of Shneis. And then going downward, we have Ben Benai, son's son. That's another Shneia. Uben Bitoi, his daughter's son. That's another Shneia. He's on Medivir Seif. Clearly. Ketani Mia, the Brisa clearly says, Avi Avim. The Chalitz is father's father. My love, Mishim Chalitz. Shall we not assume the reason why Rachel can't engage with that fellow is due to the Chalitza from Shimon? And we treat her like his wife. Vahavi Lokalas Pnoi, and to his mother's father, sorry, his father's father, Avi Avim, she's considered like. His son's daughter-in-law, which is a Shnia. Clearly, Shnia is not included. Loy, that's not the reason. Misham Misna. Let's remember. The Chalutza was also once married to Ruvain, the Mace. In which case, Shnia is truly justified. The Havila Kalas Benoit, because in this case, certainly, in relation to Shimon's father's father, who also happens to be Ruvain's father's father, she is father's father's Son's daughter-in-law. But since it's on account of marriage, certainly Shniyas are included. But by Chalutza, who knows? Tashma, here comes another right. Rabbi Chia said, one of the Shniyas is Avi Imai, the Chalutza's mother's father. My love, Mishim Chalutza. Shall we not assume this is due to her Chalutza from Shimon? The Havi lo Kalas Bitai. And now Rachel, the Chalutza from Shimon, Relative to Shimon's mother's father is his daughter's daughter-in-law, which is a Shnia. Clearly, Shniyas are included in the Chalutza de Rabbanu. Loy, that's not the reason for Isser. Rather, Misham Misna. Let's remember, Rachel was formerly married to Reuven. And therefore, she's Aser to Reuven and Shimon's mother's father. The Havila Kalas Bita. She is his daughter-in-law's daughter. Sorry, his daughter's daughter-in-law. But since we're speaking about a real wife here, she was once really married to Reuven, we understand perfectly well why Shniyas are included. But by Chalutza, who knows? Tashma, here comes a good right. Ube ben benoi, Rabbi told us. Who is the next Shniyah that's Aser? Ben benoi. The Chalutz Shimon's son's son. My love Shem Chalutz. Is it not due to Rachel's Chalitza from Shimon? That makes his son's son usher on her. Why? The Havila Eshes Avi Aviv. This is another form of a Shnia. Because Rachel is considered as though she is his father's father's wife. That's a Shnia. Look, that's not why. Misha Misna. Because of her marriage to Ruvain. Way, way back when. The Havila Eshes Achi Avi Aviv. Because Rachel, by having married Ruvain, is considered his great aunt. Whose great aunt? Shimon's son's son, right? Go back up one generation. Go back up two generations. Move over to Ruvain. Rachel is Aishas, the wife of the brother of his grandfather. Right? And this is because she was married to Ruvain. Certainly by regular Isha, we include Shneas as well. But it's unrelated to Chalitza. But that doesn't work. Amemar tells us back on the Chavez, we never extend Shniyas this far. Answer, Amemar mukim lo mishim chaylitz. You're right. We're going to Amemar. We're left with no choice. The reason for the Isser here is because of Rachel's chalitza to Shimon. That's why she's Asr on Ben Bnei of Shimon. Even though it's a Shniya, you're right. Because Savar, Gazru, Shneis, Barayis, clearly. According to Amemar's interpretation of Rabbi Chiyas Braisa, Shneis does apply to a Chalutza. We treat her like a regular Isha. Tashma, here comes another right. The fourth Shnia mentioned by Rabbi Chia was Ube Ben Bitai. The Chalutza may not marry the son of Shimon, the Chalutz, his daughter. My love, Mishim Chalutz, apparently due to her Chalutza from Shimon. The Havila Eshes, Avi Ima, in which case Rachel is considered the wife of his mother's father. And that's another form of Shniya. 
I'm like, that's not why. Mishamisna. On account of her marriage to Ruvain in the past. The Havila Eshes Achi Avi Imai. In which case, Shimon's Ben Bitoi is Asr to her because she's considered to him what? The wife of the brother of his mother's father. And that's a Shnia. But it's legitimate because this is due to her real marriage with Ruvain. And Isha includes Shnia. Right? What do you mean, Vahagabi Shnia is the Erva like Gazru? We know that this far back, we never apply even by an Erva. Wife of a brother of a father is mother, that's, that's too far out. Even by a regular wife, we wouldn't say that. El Lavashim Chaylitz, oh, must be. That the issue here pertains to the Chalitza that occurred between Shimon and Rachel. And that makes her usher on Shimon's Ben Bitoi because she's like a grandmother. Although Shnia, a grandmother, nevertheless. Ushmamina, clearly, goes Rushnia is Bechalutza, Shmamina. Even by Chalutza, we apply not only the Isra for close relatives, but we certainly include the outer circle as well. We treat her like a Grusha and a former wife. And the Mishnah concluded with the statement as follows Although a relative of a Chalutza is Asr to the Chalutz, but a relative of the Tsar of the Chalutza is Mutter. Omar Rav Tuvi Bar Kisn, Omar Shmo. Habal Tzoraz Chalutza, Havlad Namsa. Listen to this. Reuben passes away. Leaves behind Rachel and Leah. Shimon does Chalitza to Rachel. And then one of the brothers himself, or others, lives as married with the Tzor of the Chalutza, with Leah. He did an Issa Karis, she's an Erva, she's an Eshes Ach, and they generate a Mamza. My time, and why? Be Surah Kaima. She remains also. Rachel had Chalitza, not me. I'm a regular sister in law. Omar Yasef, Avananam Tanina. I will prove this point from our mission, which says, Mutar Adam, Bekroivas, Tzoras Chalutzasa. Although, the relative of a Chalutza is also. But nothing wrong with marrying the relative of the contemporary, the companion wife of the Chalutza. Apparently, she is unaffected, the Tsar is unaffected by the Chalutza. It's not, it's not as though she also went through Chalutza and the Chalutza sort of represented them all. No, the Chalutza is a Chalutza. The other wife is a plain uh, Eshesach. And that's why the uh, brother can marry the, the relative of that Eshesach because she's not a Chalutza. This works well if the Tzara, the woman who had no Chalitza done to her, Leah, remains sort of out of the loop, unaffected by the Chalitza. That's the reason that explains why Muta Ba'chaisa, you can marry your sister, because she's not a Chalitza. Who disqualifies her relatives? Eli, Amrus, Tzara, Chalitza, Damya. But if you maintain that Chalitza done to Chalitza done to Rachel, sort of exempt and uh, is mighty. It's as though you're doing it for Leah as well. She's also a chalutza, and therefore, if he's Ba Leah, there's no chorus. It's just a chalutza. Am I mutter? Why would he be mutter to marry her relatives? She's a she's a chalutza, and the relatives are kribes chalutza. From the fact that the Mishnah allows you to marry a relative of a tsara of a chalutza, apparently the tsara is not considered a chalutza. That's a big kash. Leima to have it. You have to Rabbi Yechon. It's a kash on Rabbi Yechon. The Amar. He says, he has a different, Rabbi Yechon's approach is as follows. He says, when one brother does chalitza to one yivama, he is representing all brothers, she's representing all yivamas. We view it as though they all went through the chalitza process. It's like a shlichas. Damar bein hu, bein achin, whether the chalitza himself or the other brothers, ein chayavan, lo yala chalitza karis, there's no curse between them and the Chalutza because although the other brothers didn't do Chalutza, it's as though they did through him. She's a Chalutza for all of them. Likewise, Valayala Tsarasa curse. If they engage with the Tsara who didn't really have Chalutza, there's no curse. She loses the Ashes Ach status. She's considered a Chalutza. Why? Although she didn't have Chalutza, but her Tsara did. 
and she, and she represents her as well. So and all the women in the family, all the tsaris, are deemed to have gone through the chalitza process. Why would the Mishnah not the Mishnah by us not treat her like a chalitza? Why can you marry her relative? Amalech Rabbi Yechanan responds Rabbi Yechanan. Vitispra, what do you think? Achoyz chalitza day, right? So you think that the whole concept in the Mishnah is not Torah? V'amar ish lakish, kan shana Rabbi, Rabbi taught us over here. Achoyz grusha medivere Torah. Right? Down later on, right? Rabbi teaches us. Actually, the next Mishnah. That menat Torah. One may not marry a sister of a grusha. But a chutz chalutza, that's only with the very seifrim. Oh, so that being the case, we can understand that the Issa de Rabban of marrying a relative of a chalutza only applies to the chalutza herself, but not to the tzara who technically did not go through a chalutza. Although, in halacha, in the longest, we treat her as though she went through the chalutza, chalutza process. But practically, she didn't have chalitza, and therefore the Yisad Rabban pertained to her relatives was not activated. If that's the case, asks the Gemara, Maishna Hayu Maishna Hai. So let's get back and take a look, look at the Mishnah. You can marry the relative of the Tzor of the chalitza, as we just explained, but then the Mishnah concludes, Tzoras Kroves But there's an Isser with respect to marrying a Tzorah of the sister of the Chalutza. What's the difference between one and the other? Why is a Kroivas Tzoros Chalutza Mutter? And why is a Tzoros Kroivas Chalutza Aser? <laughs> Answers the Gemara. A big difference. Hach to Azla Bahadala Beidina Gaz Buhu Rabbanu Rashi explains an Isha finds it hard to go to the Bezin herself. She needs support. She needs her sister to hold her hand while she's going through the Chalitza process. So typically, when Rachel comes to Bezin, her sister comes along with her. Oh, people might mistake it, might think that Leah got the Chalitza. Look, she was in Bezin, maybe she got the Chalitza. And they'll confuse things. We treat Leah as though she went through the Chalitza. And therefore, You can't marry the tsara of that relative either. Because they'll think, oh, you married the tsara of the chalutza. That's certainly also. Right? So there's two Yavamis, and one was Nechlat, you can't marry the other one. So that explains the Mishnah. You cannot marry the tsara of the relative of your chalutza because the relative comes along. It'll appear that she got the chalutza. Therefore, keep away from her, from her tsara. Right? Just like the chalutza herself is aser, and the chalutza is relative. The tzara of the chalutza is relative as well as included, because people might think that the relative was the one who got chalitza. But an isha doesn't come along to the best, like the tzara. She had enough, enough of her in her lifetime, during her husband's lifetime. She doesn't come to help her out in the bezin. So in this case, you have Rachel and Leah. Rachel gets the chalitza, and Leah stays far away. It's clear that she, she didn't get the chalitza. Like God's Rabbanon, in that case, there's no reason to apply any iser to uh, Leah's relatives. It's clear that Leah did not go through chalitza. And therefore, her relatives are mutter. And that's what we say, mutter adam bekreivas, tzorah's chalitza, say, one may marry a sister of the tzorah, of the isha who got chalitza. Okay, let's do a quick chazara. We learned about the shiori mincha. It should be eaten in pure form, as pure matzah. Uh, as opposed to a uh, Pesach, where the uh, dough is scolded and then baked, that would be okay. Okay, what about the Yerusha of the departed brother? A chalitz does not get. He doesn't get special privileges. He's treated like the other brothers. A miyabim does take over his Yerusha. Rabbi Yehuda says if there's a father around, he gets priority. A choylet and a chalutza an aser in each other's kroivim. Ishniyas are included as well. Only the choylets cannot marry her relatives, but his brothers can. And we learned that the relative of a chalutza goes along to Bezin. 
it would appear that she gets chalitza, and therefore her tzara is asr as well, because the tzara of a chalitza is uh, also a sister-in-law, and uh, we want to keep away from any misconceptions. Whereas in the reverse, if it's a tzara of the chalitza, she doesn't come along to Bezdin. Nobody thinks she gets the uh, chalitza, and therefore her relative is mutter. That's Rabbi Yechon's approach. Um, but the, the first approach to Nimar was that actually the, the tzara is not considered as though she went through the chalitza process. Right? And therefore we say if one engages with her, one of the brothers engages with her, he gets karas. It's like a regular sister in that case. There's no need to add any isa craven, which only applies to a chalitza. All the best to you and tons of atzlach. Be well.